pray. She will be there at 6.30 in the morning to have uh, eye surgery, and, and they are praying desperately that it goes well, so she'll be able to drive again soon. Uh, Miss Jenny is here from Corvallis with us. Yay! Yay. Glad to be here with you. Mr. Jason lost his beard. Sometimes good intentions don't go the way you plan. Oh, yeah. You ever have good intentions and, and sometimes they just don't go the way you plan. They just, you know, our best intentions sometimes just don't work the way we plan for them to work. Um, for me, my intentions to go in the living room and get something from the bedroom could be forwarded along the way because I forgot what I was going for. Come on. And so I stand in there and I look around, I come back, that's when he says, Where's this at? Uh, I'm going to get it now. <laughs> now I remember what I was going after because you reminded me. But good intentions sometimes. Uh, I read a story this week about college kids. And how many are college folks? How many have been to college? Some at least. Right? So, um, and, and college kids were in the dorm and they found some extra money. And so they wanted to fix up their college dorm. What better way to fix up your dorm if you're a college kid than beanbags, right? You want to add beanbags to everything. So they picked the most <laughs> responsible of all the boys. They gave him the money and they sent him to get beanbags. So an hour goes by, two hours, three hours, four hours, and his intention was to go get beanbags. And about six hours later, he shows up, he walks in, they go, where's the beanbags? He said, I bought a ferret. Look, guys, we have a ferret. Right? Because sometimes good intentions don't work quite the way they should. So it was, it was a nice ferret, though, evidently. I don't know. But this morning I want to talk to you about that. We started this year talking about finishing it. And each of us has something different that we need to finish in our life. But there's a key that I want to finish with this year. Uh, that I want us to get a very simple, simple message. And the title of my message this morning is Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, why would we talk about Jack and the Beanstalk? Well, Jack's intention when he left to go get uh, a cow was not to bring back beans, right? His intention was not to bring back magic beans. His intention was not to do that at all, but that's what he ended up with. And then he ended up with a lot more with giants and everything else. In Scripture, Jesus tells us what our intention should be, and he lays it out for us. And then sometimes I think if we're not careful, we get lost along the way. So in Matthew 22, Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry. <coughs> Let me go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this group of men and women. Uh, we love them so very much. I pray that you bless them in all that they do in your precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you for those that have been praying for uh, Steve and Christina and his family with the loss of his brother this week. And, uh, and also those that are fasting that we talked about for the last couple of weeks. Thank you to those that are fasting. I know that's not easy. Uh, some of the fasts have been uh, bad attitudes. That, and one person said they would have fasted food for 21 days if they knew how hard fasting a bad attitude was going to be. Uh, and uh, others are fasting sugar. And uh, I found out last week while I was preaching that I was fasting potatoes, which I do not believe is of God, but nevertheless it came out of my mouth, so therefore I'm fasting potatoes. And uh, I'm a potatoes fan. So uh, anyway. Matthew 22, Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. Uh, he's gone into the temple in Matthew 22 to cast out the money changers. They're actually trying to make money on people worshiping. They're trying to make money on people worshiping. So he's wanting to cast them out. Now their intent probably originally was not to do that, but over time their mindset changed and they became that way. Some of the greatest televangelists you've ever met or you've ever seen in your life, people go, well, all they ever talk about is money. Their ministry didn't start that way. Their ministry started out right and true. Somewhere along the way, they may have lost, or most of them anyway, they may have lost their way and they've, they've kind of lost the intent of where they were going. But 
Jesus is casting out the money changers, and he's offending the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are there. And so they're upset, they're frustrated, and they're going to get back at him. And the scripture actually tells us in Matthew 22 that they are planning to trick Jesus. They're going to trick him. They're going to catch him. Um, so they're really going to put him on trial here and try to catch him, if you will. So they are going to ask him questions that will condemn him, or at least, at the very least, that will divide the church. That's their goal. So the first question they ask begins in verse 15, and they, they kind of set a trap, and they say, Teacher, should we give money to Kaiser, taxes, Caesar, or however you want to pronounce it, we'll say Caesar, but um, do, should we give money to him or not? And Jesus said to them, being knowing what they were doing, he said to them, give me a coin. He gave them a coin. They said, he said, whose picture is on it? It's Caesar. And he said, then give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Give unto God what is God. So he kind of caught them right there, and there was nothing they could do to help. There was, they were at a point where they just went away silently, the scripture tells us. Because they didn't know what to say at that point. They thought they could catch him. The next question they asked him was about marriage and the resurrection. And they said, teacher, there was a woman married a man. And he died. And the, square, the law says that her brother, his brother, is to come into her and to raise children with her so that she can, he can have offspring. Well, the brother died. And there were seven brothers. And each one married the wife. And each one passed away. And then she died. In the resurrection, who will she be married to? Teacher, tell us. And Jesus said these words to them. He said, there is no marriage in the resurrection. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the God of the living, not the dead. And it silenced them. They couldn't catch him in saying something that they were trying to trick him with. And it literally says to the point that they, that they were silent and they left silent. This is where we're going to pick the story up this morning. Matthew 22, beginning with verse 34. I'll give you a moment to turn there. I won't ask you to stand this morning, but beginning in verse 34, this is the third question that was asked. But when the Pharisees had heard that he gathered, that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great command in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, Hang all the law and the prophets. They asked Jesus a question. What is the greatest commandment? Now history tells us this. That the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the days of old would sit around and argue which is the greatest law of all. Now I know that doesn't happen in the church today, right? We never argue doctrine in the church. But there were 613 Old Testament laws. 613. And 13 Old Testament laws, and they would argue. Among those laws were over 300 do nots. Now, can you imagine this? Every time you reach to touch something, don't do that, don't do that. And every time you didn't touch something, you're supposed to do that. There were 285 things they were supposed to do, over 300 things that they were not supposed to do. 613 laws in total in the Old Testament. And it literally, by the way, if you think you live under grace and there's no commandments, there's more than a thousand in the New Testament, just throwing that out there. But here's what he literally said to them. They said, which one is the greatest? Because they like to argue. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to argue Scripture. In fact, I, I shy away from arguing Scripture. Honestly, there's really no point in arguing Scripture, because if you're arguing with somebody, they've already got their mind made up, right? But they were trying to find out which scripture's a misdemeanor, which one's a felony, which one's what and what. So for one group, right, it would be the greatest law of all is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the greatest law of all. I'll fight you. There is no other law greater than the Sabbath. That is the greatest law. For others, it's thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill is the greatest law. For others, if you commit. Do you know there's still churches today that believe God will 
will save you. But if you've been married and divorced, you're damned from then on. You can never, ever, ever be forgiven for that. God will forgive you for anything but divorce. Are you scary? Are you reading the same book? But when you're in trouble, dude, it's over for you, right? I don't even know why you're here, right? But people got so caught up that they literally would fight over everything. And so they're asking Jesus, well, which is the greatest law of all? Which is the greatest one? Because they're arguing about laws. Now, I know we don't do that today. That's why we have churches like the Church of God of Prophecy, the Church of God, the Church of God in Christ, the Church of God, that the, the Baptist, the Primitive Baptist, the Seven-Day Baptist, the, the Southern Baptist, the, the you know, uh, United Pentecostal Baptist, or the First Lutheran Methodist congregation or whatever it might be out there. It's because God's people got so caught up in time that they literally got so messed up that they lost their way and they came back with magic beans. They've got a new revelation, a magic bean. And you know what the magic bean's going to do? It's going to cause you to fight giants that you were never meant to fight. That should have never been there in the first place. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said these words, and I hope to break this down a little bit more next week, but he said these words. He said, all the law and all the prophets hinge on this. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Everything I'm going through and everything I will ever go through hinges on whether I have the right love for God and other people. Every issue that will ever come my way hinges on how much I love my God and how much I love other people. I know that there are people that go, you should let Mark Scott preach more. He's a preacher. I understand that, and he does a phenomenal job. But what you don't understand is this. I have the privilege and the honor to honor my God and present his gospel three times a week. I have the privilege. Some people say, well, I have to go preach. I don't have to go preach. This is an honor to stand up here and say, thus saith the Lord. Because truth is this. Everything hinges on my love for him. Last week when we talked about fasting and we talked about that it was going to cost you something. Monday morning I get up and I'm getting ready to head out. I'm getting ready to come here for a prayer meeting. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said these words. He said it's not about what it's going to cost them. And that's what they hear. What it's about is the condition of their heart. He said because true love wants to give. True love wants to give. And I began to meditate on my life, and I began to think about things like that, and I thought, you know what? The only way I can comprehend love, I cannot comprehend or fathom the love of God. It's greater than my mind and my heart are able to understand or comprehend. But what I can understand is love for family. And I'll just do it like this so we don't get mushy and gooey or whatever. I'll talk about my children. When they hurt, I go sit in my room and cry like a baby. <laughs> Every hurt I've ever felt is enforced and it's pushed because they're hurting. And this love I feel, and all I want to do is do something to help them. All I want to do when Wendy and, Be and, and Becca get in a fight is I want to defend Becca. And that's terrible. It's not the right. But all I want to do is fight. All I want to do is help. My kids need something. And I need something. And I put aside what I need for them. And that's the love I have for my children. That's the love I hope you have for your children or maybe your parents or maybe your spouse. Again, yeah, when we got here, sitting right back in there somewhere, about where President Lori's sitting. <laughs> I'll be good after the day, I promise. <laughs> I am so proud of you. You just yeah. do not know. Yeah. Oh, your family is amazing. We love you. But Miss Crystal's sitting there in its choir practice or worship practice, and she looks up here.
here and she goes, look at him. And he's up here jamming on the guitar and she goes, he is so sexy. And I went, <laughs> she said, gosh, he looks good. Because here's reality. That's what love is. Love, your heart races when the one you love steps into the room, right? They literally, your heart begins to race, and all of a sudden, my son, when he's coming in from Tennessee, I'm like giddy for three weeks. I'm like bouncing off the wall. I can't wait to grab him. And although I talk to him every day, I can't wait to just squeeze his neck and tell him how much I love him. And then the last day that he's here, there's this, this rage inside that he has to go back. Because love, when you truly love, all you want to do is be with that person. When you truly love, with your heart and your mind, you can't wait. You anticipate the moments. So every moment when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is, I'm giddy to be with God, right? No. No, I'm not. Sadly, I can sing songs and tell you how much I love it. But then I began to complain about all the problems, all the aches, and all the pains, and, and limp towards the restroom, right? So I can get my whole back moving again. And everything is about me, which says my love for him is not what it should be. And I begin to focus on things, and I begin to look this week, and I'm thinking, God, I want to love you. Because here's what it says, all the law and all the prophets. Now catch this. I hope to spend most of next year talking about the Holy Ghost and the power and the anointing and the authority of the Holy Ghost. But can I say this to you? Before the first prophecy was spoken, God is love and he was there before there was ever a prophecy. Love showed up before the first miracle. Love showed up before the creation of the word. The earth, love, has to come first. And we say things like, I love God with all my heart and I hope my neighbor's puts hell wide open. <laughs> or what my Sunday school teacher said. You ready for this one? Here's what my, one of my, I was about this big Sunday school teacher. He said a lot of things you shouldn't have said. But I won't go to that. <laughs> Maybe tell you in private sometimes it wouldn't help. You're not going to make me anyway, right? You're doing it.
you don't love God with all your heart, you should go back to step one, stage one, start over and learn to love God. Amen. Because if you can't love God, you're not going to have the full anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you can't love God and you can't love your neighbor, you're not going to have the full power. And we begin to talk, and we, but we get caught up in these things. We don't ride the church down the road. The reality, we will fight over anything in a church. We're getting ready to have a church-wide meeting in January in all probability. We're going to work with the deacons in the next few weeks to do that and talk about where the next upgrades go or whatever. And, and at the end of the day, you know what? Church is split over the color of a carpet. We forget the love of Christ. We forget sometimes the main thing. And instead of bringing back a cow, I got magic beans. I worship on the seventh, the seventh day. I believe Saturday is the Sabbath day. In fact, to be honest with you, do you know a lot of people don't know when the Sabbath changed? It never changed. Let me make that clear. It never changed. There was a man named Constantine that wanted to separate Jewish worshipers with Christian worshipers, and he converted Christianity's worship from Saturday to Sunday to make a little divide. Well, isn't it in the Bible? No, no, it's because of Easter. No, no, what does it matter? The Bible says every day is a day of worship. Every day is a day that I am to worship my God. And if I fight you over a day of the week and you split hell wide open, all I've done is damn the kingdom of God when I should have never done that in the first place. If all I do is fight you over every little thing along the way, if I can love my God with all my heart, here's what he said. He said, all, all the laws, everything hangs on this. If we can just love. You want to finish it this year? Learn to love. Give God the same love you give your children. Jason, you love them boys? We need to love God that way. You love your children? I know you do. At 10.30 the other night, we got messages from you. My kids are in the same state. My kids are all in order. My kids, you can hear the excitement over a text. The phone vibrated louder. <laughs> As it should be. <laughs> but when we be, when we put healing, God's magic beans of healing, God's magic beans of deliverance, God's magic beans of, of Holy Ghost power and anointing and authority, and we forget that we're supposed to love God first and love neighbors as ourselves. And in essence, what we do is cancel out the power and authority of God in our lives because we never took what was first. What he said is the utmost. I want to see tongues, interpretation, prophecy, healing, deliverance, devils cast out the same as everyone else. But if you hate your neighbor and you're trying to cast out a devil, you better watch where that booger goes next. Because <laughs> he might show up at your doorstep. Don't lose the focus. I say this in love. I'm going to say one more thing. I'm going to quit. Because we got cake out there, but I can't eat it. It ain't potatoes. Right. Oh, potatoes. <laughs> I can't eat out either, which is hard for my lifestyle because I'm on the road a lot. That's okay. 19 more days, right? No, I don't know how many days. 22nd of December. <coughs> starts. This is the word of the Lord to Malachi. I love 
se pero vamos a ser más fuertes en igual. There's a man that, that attends our congregation on a regular basis, and he made a statement to me the other day. His wife had a stroke, and she is in pretty bad shape, and she's been that way for a while, and he has to take complete care of her. And I was asking how long they've been married, and he said somewhere like Kurt and Linda in the 60-year range. And he said, uh, I said, so how is it now? And he said, it's never been worse. And I thought, wow. I said, well, I'm sorry. He said, no, you didn't hear what I said. He said, you didn't hear what I said. He said, I took vows 60 years ago that said for better or for worse. And he said, son, it's never been worse. Because when you love someone, worse doesn't figure into that. It's always been better. Through all the mess and through all the anguish and through all the stress and through all the trials, he said, it's never been worse. And I thought, my God, what a statement. For everything that God allows me to go through, can I say to him, because it's a marriage to him, right? With the bride of Christ. Can I take a vow with him and say, for better or worse, no matter what comes my way, I'm going to love you more every day. No matter how much mess comes my way, I'm going to love you more every day. Am I giddy to spend time with him like I would be when my son is coming in or to sit with Micah or to, or to hopefully go shoot some guns today or, or whatever you're doing with whoever that you love. That moment of anticipation that you might see them. That moment of anticipation that you might hear their voice. That hope that you might just get to hear their voice. say the best thing I can ever share with you is love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and everything else. <coughs> every drug addiction, every financial burden, <coughs> everything else hinges on love. I just come to share this with you today. Don't miss out on what God has for you after them, seek them, desire them, and yet I will show you something better. And he starts chapter 13 like this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, though I walk in all authority and power and anointing, if I don't have love, I'm just making noise. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he said, have supernatural faith. Have hope beyond limits. But the greatest of these, love. Church, don't be jacked. Keep your eye on the prize. Because it's easy for all of us to get so twisted along the way that we miss the prize. That we miss what we're looking for. And what we're looking for is an intimate relationship with Christ Jesus. Everything else will work itself out. Everything else is, is win, lose, or draw will work itself out. But our focus has to remain on the main thing. And that's a walk with Christ Jesus. Can we give him praise in the house?
some way, your Holy Spirit will use the words that I've spoken from your word. Let us see that since the beginning of time, love has always been before the first prophecy, before the first tree was planted. Love. That you are loved. And let us learn to love you and others that way. Help us to grow in you. Stand with me if you will. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you've walked away from him, today all you have to do is come home. He's waiting on you. For every other need in this place, this altar is open today. Whatever your need, this altar is open. And I would say to you this year, finish. Finish it. Settle it that God is number one in your life, period. Settle that.